So the second part of our discussion about ecological models involves something that we call the behavioral ecological model. Now, you read the chapter by Hovell and where he describes the behavioral ecological model and really emphasizes that um, while this is an ecological perspective, meaning um, you know, kind of very broad scale community level, um, it also incorporates a lot of the uh, behavior modification constructs, things like reinforcement. Um, and that's that's really the added uh, value above and beyond the, the basic ecological model. So uh, this is really interesting um, dimension and one that, um, that I think most people find to be um, valuable in helping uh, be uh, direct the ecological model. So the fact that there are these added constructs related to behavior change adds some specificity to the traditional ecological model. <clears throat> um, and, and really, um, a lot of what Hubble does in his behavioral ecological model is extend it beyond, uh, he, he extends the um, behavior modification constructs to a population or large group. So a lot of when we discussed the uh, um, behavior modification constructs, um, stimulus control and um, reinforcement and punishment and things like that, those um, historically have been strategies and constructs that have been used almost at the individual level or with, with small groups. And so what Hubble does is, is says that those are very valid strategies for changing behavior, um, and, and so they can be applied at the community level. What's really interesting is that he emphasizes that um, the different levels of the ecological model interact, and he's really the first one to make this recognition that behavior change happens in both directions. So uh, the traditional ecological model is very concentric, meaning it kind of starts at the individual level and progressively moves out. As I'll show you in just a minute, Hubble conceptualizes the ecological model in a different way, um, and that behavior goes, uh, behavior change happens both ways and is the influence of each level interacting and modifying and changing and influencing the other level. So I'm going to give you three examples today of how that happens. Um, uh, but, but real quickly, um, uh, kind of the, the ecological model, behavioral ecological model and these hierarchical or interacting or what Hubble might call cascading contingencies. Um, uh, simple examples relate to um, the New Deal, this post-war industrialization that, uh, uh, that, that we've read about in America and certainly see the effects of now. Um, so of course a lot of people coming home from the war and we had a lot of equipment that had been um, produced to aid in the uh, assist in the war effort. And uh, coming home from the war, we've got all of this equipment and we need to put people to work. And so we get the New Deal and we begin constructing highways all over the U.S. And there's just this, this manifesto to, to, to create tons of um, uh, road infrastructure and highways. And so now we have interstates connecting um, you know, states and you can travel for, on the same road for uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, really uninterrupted. Um, and so what that allowed for then was the ability for us to 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 construct suburbs or um, housing developments that were a considerable distance from the downtowns. And so people could work downtown and they could live in, um, well, uh, I mean, we, we can see this in Utah where uh, you can work in Salt Lake City, but you can easily live in Draper. Um, which is really a, a <clears throat> considerable distance from the downtown area. And of course, this has happened all over the United States. Um, so really what uh, w one of the effects of this is that uh, we spend more time driving, um, which by implication means that we spend less time walking. And so one of the <clears throat> causes, if you will, of our um, sedentary lifestyle in the U.S. is... Um, could be traced all the way back to the New Deal and this post-war industrialization. Of course, there are many other contributing factors, and this represents our lifestyle now, 
but but it but it might actually be the result of some of these um, larger effects. <clears throat> One of the other um, kind of interesting examples um, is the as as uh, farming in the United States became more, um, and and this is an example taken from. Uh, Michael Pollan's books um, in in defense of food and uh, an omnivore's dilemma um, and and these um, uh, depict um, a, a circumstance where the crop yield in the United States and a farmer's um, productivity and ability to produce more food increased dramatically over the last hundred years and of course over the last uh, uh, several decades and so this is amounted to a surplus. In, in food, so where historically, um, you know, most of the food that, food that was produced was consumed, well, in the United States, we have the capacity to produce much more food than is, is consumed by uh, our population, and so we have an enormous surplus. And that surplus, of course, would over time drive down the price of, in this case, corn. So in order to... Um, keep the price of corn stable so that we can keep farmers producing it um, and, uh, and and not go out of business, um, the government has provided subsidies to corn farmers. And so uh, we have to have something to do with all of this surplus corn that is continue, uh, continually produced as a result of these subsidies. So it's not this self-correcting process because these subsidies are involved. Uh, we have a lot of surplus corn, and so it's been sitting around, and so uh, quite some time ago we decided that we would start feeding it to cows. Uh, well, corn is not a, 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 um, a food item that cows would normally eat, um, as you know they would normally be kind of grass-fed and, and, and engage in a lot of grazing, but now that they are corn-fed... Um, the result is that we have a lot of obese cows, um, and as a result of these obese cows, we now eat these cows that have a higher, um, a higher percentage of fat in them, so we are consuming more fat in our diet. We also have more cows, um, or larger cows, more meat is being produced, and as more meat is being produced, now we have the ability, honestly, to eat um, uh, meat portions or meat servings up to three times a day. So this is very different from um, our what, we, what we've done historically. So we now are eating much more red meat than we ever have before because, and it could be traced back to this increased uh, productivity in farmers and, and the surplus and the subsidies and so forth. <clears throat> so um, Hovel's ecological model looks a lot like what you see depicted here. Now, it's, it, the similarities with a traditional ecological model are that, yes, um, the individual is still at the kind of foundation or the center of the ecological model, but what he suggests is that the contingencies, uh, meaning that uh, the, the reinforcement um, between these different levels goes both ways. And so there on the left-hand side, you can see, he says, bi-directional influence, meaning that the individual can influence the community, which can, the local network, which can influence the community, which can influence society, and vice versa. And of course, um, many examples exist of this. Uh, perhaps uh, the strongest is the California Tobacco Control Program. And I'm going to discuss that more in just a little bit. But that was really an effort um, that went both directions. It was very bi-directional. So there were policies that influenced communities, influenced local networks, and ultimately the individual to uh, not smoke. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or to quit smoking. Uh, but also the... the uh, um, initiation of the legislation and the policies at the society level really were the result of individual um, efforts. And so individuals uh, that were tired of um, smelling secondhand smoke and, and uh, tired of the effects of smoking um, really organized into grassroots groups 
and it moved up the chain. And so you had local efforts to um, ban smoking and that worked its way up. And so um, that, that's really a perfect example of the behavioral ecological model. And, I, and I'm going to talk more about how these levels interact. So the example that I'm <clears throat> going to uh, share with you now is a follow-up to the example um, of my research that I showed you in the ecological model. The reason why I've chosen to talk about it more as it relates to the behavioral ecological model is because um, it, it really is a perfect example of how the levels of the uh, ecological model interact with each other. So what I decided to do is test to see if the effects of having a retailer, an alcohol or tobacco retailer in your neighborhood really impacted your behavior, meaning um, alcohol or tobacco use. And so um, what I did is I, I geocoded, I, I put the um, location of each study participant on a map. Um, and so I, uh, for example, collected data from uh, an adolescent living right here. And of course, this is right along the U.S.-Mexico border um, down toward the bottom picture there. You can see there's a a red uh, red building that stretches across the, uh, the the road. That's uh, right there where you enter into Mexico. So this is the the San Ysidro border crossing, which is the busiest border crossing in the world uh, for any international border. And so I I, I I coded on a map where all of these kids lived, 